just see yeah, the flag yeah. if I turn it a bit. And uh, I, I uh, was one of the original two leaders of this group back in 2012, and uh, I uh, have the privilege and honour of uh, convening these meetings each month of uh, our global community, the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, which is hosted here in Toronto by the OCAD University Strategic Innovation Lab, or SLAB. Uh, so we are a, a community uh, practice, we're a knowledge mobilization initiative, exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. And that's what we've been doing in various different ways since 2012. So I'm gonna give a, a, a few minutes of introduction, uh, and then I'm gonna hand over to our speaker this month, who is uh, Maurice Fidelli from the University of South Queensland. Um, which and uh, the project that he's uh, been working on, which uh, uh, he'll talk about uh, shortly. So um, I'd like to open by something that we do here in Canada uh, now as a matter of course in uh, following up on the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, with the First Nations uh, that were here in the territory that is now called Canada long before us settlers were here. And so although uh, obviously this applies to Canada, what I've done is uh, genericize this so that it can apply to anybody anywhere in the world. Uh, so um, wherever we are today, uh, this is in fact sacred land and we're privileged to be where we are today. This land, the nearby lakes and the sea, depending on where you are, has supported human beings for thousands of years, in some cases tens of thousands of years, and it's rich in history. And I'm just going to mute everybody because I can hear some background conversations going on here. Make sure that, and there's a couple of people who have just joined, uh, Laurie. Um, so, uh, and we're privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and the beyond. So seven generations is uh, our grandchildren's grandchildren, not that far in, into the future. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honour and respect peoples indigenous to your place. And that may, of course, include yourselves. And today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to peoples from across the world. And we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's kind of a social uh, acknowledgement of our privilege. But I also want to uh, do an acknowledgement that's far more biophysical. Uh, so I invite you to consider, do you know what watershed you're in? And for those of you who've been in the room here a few times, you'll definitely know where we are. Uh, but do you know where you are in it, with what the name of your watershed is? But you can uh, re reply by putting uh, your answers into the chat. So uh, we're in a building very close to the one that's in the photograph here, uh, which is uh, downtown uh, Toronto. Uh, and that is the main building of the Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, and so for us here in the room, um, we are uh, sitting on, a, on the edge of a watershed known as Russell Creek, known by the settlers as Russell Creek. Um, and we polluted that so badly that we buried it and turned it into a sewer in about 1870 something. Um, the, the, this uh, uh, creek definitely has an indigenous name, I just haven't been able to locate it yet. So I'm always on the lookout for uh, somebody who can uh, help me be uh, more uh, historically accurate. Um, and so one of the reasons we make this biophysical recognition is because, of course, this session is important, is connected to the place that we're in and, and is dependent upon the places that we're all in. Uh, and so just think about where the sewer in your building connects to. I'm sure you visited the bathroom before this meeting or maybe you will just afterwards. And you're dependent on the ecosystem service uh, that is provided by the watershed that you are in. And for those of you using the Flourishing Business Canvas, which is one of the tools developed by this community, this watershed is a collection of vital biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services upon which we are all interdependent. Um, so we are, uh, as of a day or so ago, um, a tribe of uh, 1,730 uh, people around the world. Uh, here we have somebody from Europe joining us, Michael Sillion. Good afternoon, Michael, or good evening, Michael. Um, and so we are collectively expert practitioners, researchers, and students uh, from around our world. Um, we are what we believe is the world's first group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from three different perspectives where we believe we are contributing something different from probably most other people. The first is that we're taking a micro ecological economic perspective. So we're using ecological economics as the basis for our thinking, so systems thinking view of economics. 
Uh, secondly, we're using anticipatory system dynamic systems design uh, epistemologies and approaches to do the work that we do. Uh, and we have a strong normative purpose. We're not afraid of saying that uh, our goal is to enable the possibility to flourish uh, for flourishing. So uh, we're not like a lot of research organizations who, who don't admit to their normative biases. So hopefully you're in the right place and that you're, you, you, you find yourself in a tribe of people like you, uh, that you, a tribe that you want to be part of. So um, our members put into practice and undertake action research around all of these topics and in the, all these ways. And as a, as a, we offer hopefully a global network of possibilities for your education and research and employment. And one of the reasons that we are a community is to help each other do the uh, work around uh, this topic and to find uh, interesting and new people to collaborate with. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please contact our community animators. Uh, we have one of them on our call today, Laurie Fairley, um, and, sorry, Farley, and uh, Laurie is in Calgary, Alberta, and the other, uh, I'll be introducing her shortly on the LinkedIn group. I haven't uh, managed to do that yet. Uh, and the second community animator isn't here today, unfortunately, uh, Tim Hosolt, who's uh, uh, based uh, in a combination of Germany and Toronto, and I've forgotten the name of the place in Germany. Okay, uh, so I, I'm not going to go through the group goals. Uh, this presentation will be available like all of our materials from all our meetings in our Google Drive, which is drive.ssbmg.com, down at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and so you're welcome to peruse the detail uh, here. So I'm just going to pick out a few other slides uh, from this deck to uh, talk about briefly. Um, the first thing is um, we got more signals in the last three or four months that the world is heading in our direction. Uh, we had a, a, some of us had a very a powerful meeting with um, the UN uh, Institute of Training and Research in December, uh, where we learned that uh, for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres has suggested that humanity should reflect, not celebrate, but reflect. Um, and the reflection that he's asked everybody to think about is, um, what is our purpose as a species? What's the future that we want? Um, and he has initiated the largest public consultation ever on this question. And so I invite you all to go and visit un75.online and provide your views on what you think the future should be. And obviously, uh, I hope that uh, all of our members choose to support our group's normative idea to the, to the UN Secretary General. And that's uh, that we want an agreement that our intention as a species is to enable the possibility for flourishing for all humans and all of the life, however each of us defines flourishing. Um, and uh, if you want an example of the sort of thing that you might want to do and some other information about it, I, I did a series of tweets uh, a week or two ago about this, uh, so I invite you to take a look at that. And um, yes, so we're going, the world is definitely heading in our direction. It's, it's quite amazing things that are, are starting to uh, come together. Um, so on our side, one of the things that we've started is the evolution of the group. We've been going since 2012. We're a completely voluntary uh, community. Uh, we need to formalize if we're going to really accelerate and scale. So um, in the middle of last year, we launched the Flourishing Enterprise Institute as a planetary-wide network of nodes hosted by a variety of institutions and organizations worldwide. Um, and we will also continue the community of practice uh, that will be part of or connected to the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Um, as I said, uh, for some people who were here earlier, we have some updates on this. Uh, so it's going to be a think and do tank. Um, it's, um, as I said, planetary wide network of nodes. Uh, we have the planning forum in August. Uh, one of the first nodes is at the uh, Wiesman Center for Engagement and Research and Sustainability at Wilfrid Laurier University here in Canada. But we have um, somewhere between five and ten other organizations in, interested in uh, becoming nodes in the in the near term and hopefully we'll have some announcements. Uh, here's some contact details if you want to do that. Um, so uh, I've mentioned already the community animators, um, don't need to do that again. Um, so um, we are part of a larger movement um, which we're starting to refer to as the movement for flourishing enterprises and the logos that are appearing on screen here are not only initiatives of our members, but other initiatives and organizations that we see uh, that, that either are already self-identifying with the purpose of flourishing, uh, with the objective of flourishing, or organizations we see as aligned with this purpose, even if they're not yet self-identifying 
uh, with it. So it's, it's a growing community. Um, no really famous names on here except for Hack Unitar, um, but uh, we'll, uh, hopefully this will change slowly over time. Um, and of course we are in sync and indeed going beyond the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, obviously the Sustainable Go Development Goals, an amazing gift to humanity from, from ourselves, uh, but also uh, under well understood as not uh, scientifically feasible to achieve all of them. Uh, and again, we can go into detail. This was a report that the Ecological Economist did uh, in the year that uh, the, the uh, SDGs were released. Um, we've got lots of different things going on by our members. So these are uh, a number of them. I, today, I won't go through these. You can learn more about these on our wiki. Um, and we have uh, four more uh, initiatives that uh, are uh, considering becoming recognized as initiatives of our group in order to be able to find other people to collaborate with and, and tap into the expertise in our community. Uh, so that's in fact uh, Morris Fidelli and his Thrive Project, uh, who's presenting today, and then uh, three others, uh, which uh, some of uh, have already presented um, at our community. Others, in fact, they, they, uh, the two and three are presented in past meetings. Number four will present next month. Um, and there are other initiatives that members are choosing to start up as uh, initiatives of the group. And uh, again, the community animators are here to explain the benefits of doing that and, and to help do that. Um, so we also make and sustain connections. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in mm -hmm. detail, but we have a number of uh, conferences and uh, other things that are, are very much connected to our community. Um, so just wanted to mention those. Um, we all, I, I highlighted this just before the meeting started, but I'll do it again. Um, th this book is really a, a tremendous contribution to our community. Um, because it really is the guide to strongly sustainable flourishing future fit microecological strategy development. Um, and uh, it was edited by one of our members, Dr. Thomas Wunder. About a third of the articles in this book are contributions from members. Uh, and to be transparent, I'm one of them. So uh, this is a bit of a self promotion in some respects. Um, and uh, other things that are notable about this book is it has uh, a forward by one of our members, uh, sustainable business thought leader, Dr. Tima Bansal, who many of you will know uh, because of her extensive work with the Network for Business Sustainability over the last uh, decade or more. Uh, and the introductory uh, chapter is by, uh, I would say, one of the living strategy gurus, uh, Henry Vinsberg, uh, and his chapter is called CSR 2.0. So many, many things to recommend this book to this community. Um, and there have been some posts in the LinkedIn group about this. Uh, won't go through this, uh, won't go through this. Um, so why do we have these meetings? Well, these meetings uh, we have every month and this is meeting number 87, if I'm remembering correctly, since we started. Um, these meetings are for all of us to share with each other what we're doing uh, and also as a result, we hope to inspire uh, all of us to take more action and to do more work uh, around our goal of enabling the possibility of, of flourishing. So, uh, I won't go through this, uh, I won't go through this. Uh, so, on to our speaker this month, Maurice Fidelli. Um, so, uh, Maurice, uh, I will now stop sharing my presentation here. Let me do that so you can share yours. Uh, so, while Maurice is just sharing his presentation, um, let me just say that um, Maurice has been part of the group uh, for quite a few years now. Um, he's been presenting uh, his work in a variety of forums connected to this group, like the New Business Models Conference, um, and um, uh, he, he has uh, evolved his thinking towards strong sustainability. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, and so we're very excited to uh, give Morris uh, an opportunity to sh share his work. And uh, this is in aid of uh, getting other members in this group to help him continue this work um, uh, going forward. So, Morris, uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and share your presentation. Uh, the next, how quickly did I manage to do that? I'm, I was almost on time with my 15 minutes. Uh, so you, you have about 73 minutes left and maybe just a couple of minutes at the end, at the end for me to, to close. So, Morris, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks, Anthony. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for your input to the Thrive Project and inviting me here today. Uh, you can all hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, and you can see my slides? Um, yeah. Yep, all good. 
Okay, um, I probably like uh, Anthony will probably uh, maybe go over or cut through some slides in, in uh, an effort to, to cover as, as much as we can today. Uh, I'm glad that we have such a diverse group here from scattered from around the world, practitioners and researchers and so forth. And um, I'd like to say as a fellow travelers, I say travelers because um, we're all here on the path to sustainability and beyond uh, thrivability. So you're probably familiar with the adage by Peter Drucker, uh, you can only manage what you measure. Today, I'd like to challenge you all with a related question, are we measuring what matters most? So, um, what we measure and how we measure aligns us on the trajectory towards thrivability, uh, part of what we call the infinite game, which uh, by its very nature is an ongoing uh, process. Uh, are my slides working? Yep, yeah. yep okay. Uh, so just a little bit on the format for today. Um, I'd like to start off with a bit of the history of Thrive, uh, why, how, and, and what uh, Thrive is about. Next, consider who can benefit from the Thrive project, which is actually in its uh, sixth uh, year of uh, ongoing uh, work. Uh, also look at a little bit of the theoretical underpinnings, uh, which most likely is of interest to some of the people here today, the methodology and the approach used uh, in this uh, conceptual study. And also see Thrive in action. So a little later, we'll do a bit of a test drive using the example of the seafood um, stewardship index uh, by the World Business Alliance. Uh, next, um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we do not have all the answers. Uh, however, I'll be offering everyone the opportunity to get involved and uh, contribute to this worthwhile project. And I'll finish off with uh, a question and answer session at the end. Um, these slides will be available online on the uh, Thrive platform, so you don't necessarily need to take notes along the way. I'd like to look at a quote by Dana Meadows, uh, who was an environmental scientist and um, behind the Limits to Growth book, who on the issue of the environment and in particular um, climate progress had this to say. We're getting feedback. Yep, okay, I'll carry on. Um, fostering a transition to sustainability will not be simple because unsustainable behavior does not arise simply out of ignorance or irrationality or greed. Often it is the result of the collective consequence of rational and well-intentioned decisions. People and organizations are caught up in systems, complex social structures, ranging from families and communities to corporations, governments and large scale economies that make it difficult or even impossible to act in ways that are fully responsible to all who are impacted in the present and the future. Most of us do not have the information, the resources or incentives for the freedom we need to live sustainably. So uh, basically, even even if we have the intent uh, to act sustainably, the complexity of the world and wickedness of the challenges we face make it near impossible to be sure we are acting sustainably. Sustainability is our job and we need tools to help us go beyond traditional paradigms. This so brings Morris, me just, to Sorry, yeah. Morris, I just need to uh, say, because I forgot at the beginning, we are recording this. So if anybody doesn't want to be recorded, they should leave and we hope that you don't, of course. Uh, the other thing is that the slides and the recording will be available on the SSPMG Google Drive and we'll uh, provide the link to that in the LinkedIn post about this month's meeting after the meeting is over. Sorry, Morris, go ahead. I should have said that. At the yeah. yeah, no problem, no problem. Uh, so this brings me a little bit to my backstory, the Thrive Project, why it's important and uh, I guess why our team uh, is involved with this. Uh, many attempts are bound assessing performance. However, we need to quantitatively, scientifically uh, approach uh, this challenge uh, to our pressing sustainability challenges. So, enter the Thrive project. So, let me tell you about the journey that brought us to this. Uh, for 30 years, I was a serial entrepreneur and social entrepreneur and um, building businesses and teams across three continents. Uh, combining my expertise in manufacturing, telecommunication, software development, e-commerce, banking, and so forth. Working as a consultant in the field of innovation, sustainability strategies, and driven by the love and passion for the discipline, about seven years ago, I gave up all my business interests to go full-time into this field of sustainability research. Uh, having earned degrees in high-order mathematics, computing, project manager, and MBA, and 
presently in, this, in the process this year of earning my doctorate in sustainable business innovation strategy. I'm keen to answer this question. How do we assess the strong sustainability performance of business strategy or business models? Specifically, I wanna know what makes an enterprise successful? Uh, we'll talk a little bit later as to what success looks like because it means many things to different people. Uh, our team is passionate to help enterprises achieve sustainability. And uh, as such, we research and investigate this link, uh, identifying in particular what business model innovations lead to sustainable enterprises across industries, uh, regions, uh, and going beyond traditional self-referential approaches. We discovered that many fragmented transdisciplinary approaches exist. Many are manual self-referential systems with dubious data sets. For example, many reports are simply disclosures uh, with the, you know, look at me, uh, we reduce um, water intensity by 10% or we ran raffles and donated to the local charities at year end. All noble causes for sure, uh, but more often than not motivated by financial incentives such as tax deductions, etc. So why the Thrive platform? Well, after 22 hours plus, many, many more, I stopped counting at that point, <laughs> man hours of research, the Thrive framework and open uh, source platform was born, whereby Thrive stands for the holistic, um, regenerative, innovative value uh, entity or enterprise. So holistic, because it takes a top level systems wide approach, uh, regenerative as the aim is for long-term flourishing of enterprises, Innovative, as it examines innovations at the business model level for strong sustainability. Value, as it employs a multi-capital values-based approach and using a scale-linked uh, entity as the unit of analysis. So that could be an enterprise, it could be an industry, a city, a region, country, or even the whole world. The taxonomy and, oh, it's taxonomy and uh, formulation agnostic platform. So let me tell you what Thrive is not. Um, it is not a reinvention of a new system, method, approach, scale, but rather reintegrates what is already out there, what the best science shows us we ought to be doing. It is not a new measuring stick, as it supports many different taxa. Um, if you're familiar with probably GRI, SDGs, etc. Uh, it is not an aggregator. It applies a consistent methodology based on the formula engine, and I'll get into that a little later thus ensuring uniformity and universal comparability and commensurability. It is informed by the science of industrial ecology. Whoops, whoops, things go wrong with slides. Um, it takes a systems perspective, adopting a strong sustainability stance, i.e. context and science-based. Thus it brings together what the best available sciences shows us is necessary to achieve prosperity, i.e. thriving society. It takes a systemic approach with identification of material, materiality and perspective. It is quantitative. It's informed by norms, goals, backcast, targets and metrics. And we'll go a bit into this a little later. Thrive captures what we call the infinite game. Anyone familiar with Simon Sinek and his works will, will understand this terminology. Thrive provides a realistic modeling tool based on real data. Uh, as humans, as you may know, we're fairly poor at uh, nonlinear extrapolation, so the modeling helps a lot. And as consumers, we are on the web, like chess. We know the goal, we know every move, um, only the rules of the game and the end game. Uh, sorry, not every move, only the rules of the game and the end game. As business leaders, we seek the holy grail. We want to know what is the next big thing, what strategy or business models is going to lead us to be of value. So I pose this question, uh, which um, all of you may think about, uh, especially those who here are watching uh, today who are business leaders or entrepreneur. What if you could know before you start your business or venture for your specific industry, know which business models are more conducive to success and avoid models that are proven to be failures in the long term? In fact, trends are already emerging. Uh, we can see this with our Thrive platform. There may well be, uh, a whole, this may well become the holy grail of entrepreneurship, helping enterprises transition from the why to the how. So, how to thrive. 
Well, Thrive encourages and facilitates entities to pivot to prosperity. How? By taking a systems approach, reason from first principles and a strong sustainability stance. What we mean by thrivability is for an entity to perform sustainably, scale linked across every level. We use a multi-capital uh, context and science-based approach using a commensurable formula engine. And we set targets, formulate milestones and backcast for sustainability principles. Um, to our knowledge, this is the first time this approach has ever been attempted. Um, by design, Thrive is an agnostic platform, not a repository. Other attempts amount to hand calculation or at best using spreadsheets as a tool. Most approaches are simply looking at disclosure, nominal numerator, impact data. Uh, the great majority are not context-based and are self-referential. Uh, of course, I challenge everyone on, on these points. Uh, I'm sure you'll ask that in question time. So in a nutshell, what is Thrive? Well, Thrive guides enterprises and more broadly entities towards sustainability. It does so through a process of systemic orchestration. Now, I don't know if you heard this term before, this is by, uh, coined by Barry Richmond. He's a systems dynamics advocate. Uh, systemic orchestration uh, reveals or unravels how events play out over time. In other words, milestones, backcast targets, etc. Uh, it's a reporting tool, come predictive tool, or indeed prescriptive tool. Um, Thrive supports um, first order and second order, or in other words, metascale metrics on a commensurable scale. And uh, paraphrasing the ecological economist Robert Richardson, uh, the best tool for measuring human impacts on the planet may be a dashboard of environmental indicators, not a footprint. Thrive does just that, and you will see that shortly when we do the test drive. Morris, could you say why? why Sorry? Why, is indica why are indicators better than footprint? Um, there's a lot of uh, variables that are not accounted into, into footprint. Um, not, uh, uh, not everything is included when you do a footprint, and dashboard actually gives you quantitative measurement on each individual topic. So you can actually see which aspects are motivating a particular result. Uh, one of the problems is, is substitution and we want to avoid substitution between one resource and the other. So in terms of avoiding that, a dashboard does that better. Uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later when we demonstrate Thrive. So uh, who will benefit from Thrive? Um, Thrive encourages enterprises to do good to do well in their pursuit for a competitive advantage. It uh, provides business analysts with tools to guide enterprise strategies, and it assists researchers to analyze trends and effectiveness of business models for sustainability. It allows governments to forecast the effects of regulatory or legislative actions, and it empowers individuals, that's consumers, people like you and me, to actively stimulate competition among enterprises by voting with our wallets. Uh, a case in point we experienced actually just this last year with a major uh, worldwide institution. They explained to us about a particular portfolio of 300,000 small company loans that they issue or have issued. In our discussion with them in Singapore at the time, they agreed, uh, well, we agreed to provide our, frame, our Thrive framework to them. Their purpose is to require their clients to actually provide context-based sustainability reporting in support of their client loans. Um, applications and ongoing servicing of the loan. So the plan is to eventually not provide loans to those who do not meet the sustainability criteria that they set out, uh, therefore improving the chances of getting the loan paid back. A little about the methodology. Uh, this study adopts a systemic design science research approach, which I'm sure is familiar to, to many of you here. Um, I like to just uh, just go over it, just for those who may not be aware of it. Essentially on the right, we have a, a rigor cycle where the prescriptive knowledge is uh, reviewed. On the left, we have a relevant cycle illuminated by practitioners and empirical know-how. And in the middle, we, we use progressive focusing to build on and evaluate the actual design. The overall outcome is to produce an artifact which has utility, in this case, Thrive. It's a tool to measure the strong sustainability performance of enterprise business models. Uh, additionally, 
the study is informed by the works of uh, Gregor and Jones insofar as the approach and uh, Joan van Aken uh, as it relates to the use of information systems in uh, management science and also Winter and Ayer and Baskerville in terms of implications for the action research component. For this study, we reviewed over 280 frameworks, uh, methodologies, approaches, and various other cumulative sort of studies. Uh, I won't go into, of course, all of them, but here's a small sample of perspectives and theories that have gone into formulating Thrive. Um, some of you will be familiar with the FSSD, the Framework for Strategic Sustainable Development, or you may know it as the Natural Step Method. Uh, that's backcasting from sustainability. Um, we all know the FBC by uh, Anthony Upward here. Um, the other one uh, that's part of this study is the multi-capital scorecard by Mark McElroy. Uh, another one uh, you'd be familiar with uh, perhaps is the uh, one in the, on the uh, donut economics in with social foundations and environmental ceilings by Kate Rayworth. And, uh, for on the business model side of it, one of the cumulative studies we rely on is that one by Florian Ludeke Freud uh, on the business models um, um, come sustainable business models. And of course, uh, sustainable development goals, GRIs, et cetera, and so forth. These are just some samples of uh, some of the studies that were reviewed as part of this the Building Thrive. Uh, I won't go in, how are we doing for time? I won't go too much into this, um, as probably many of you are familiar with, but the framework for strategic sustainable development, the aim of that is to backcast from sustainability principles. Um, one of the other examples, the evolution of the business model concept, um, Thrive captures this by identifying the link between business model innovation for sustainability and sustainable uh, business models. Um, another aspect is the sustainable value network where we um, look at or Thrive places the entity in the context of the greater sustainable value network and therefore we use that as a unit of analysis. So that's broader than the entity under investigation, the broader than the entity itself. Uh, one of the other big pieces to as foundation to the uh, Thrive um, platform and the Thrive framework is the foundational focus factors. I actually presented this back in 2018 at the New Business um, Model Conference, um, but essentially covers these 12 um, pieces of what I call a lattice. Um, I'll go through them quickly. One is um, taking a multi-capital approach. Um, the other one is considering uh, the transdisciplinary nature of the topic we, we're looking at, uh, employing context-based metrics, um, whereby the boundary or the unit of analysis, as I mentioned earlier, is the entity model. Um, we're looking at performance informed by uh, science-based targets and assist the transition from the linear to the circular economy. Uh, we use a values-based innovation approach and we take a strong sustainability stance, taking into account the complex wicked nature of society and the environment. And uh, we consider all material topics, uh, looking from an integrated uh, reporting point of view and recognizing the finite resources that we have at our disposal on this planet. These 12 focus factors, foundational focus factors, were reduced to four quadrants in the systemic holistic model. Um, again, I'll briefly go over this, but there's a pending study coming out in the next couple of months with my colleague and myself, where we'll be reporting on these foundational focus factors and how they become a part of the systemic holistic model. Um, one of the quadrants is significance, uh, which essentially captures the numerator, measures the impact on the scale, which is the denominator, the carrying capacities or vital capitals. And we take into account the shift, which is the weight and allocation, allocation proportions based on, on values or purposely um, retreating certain um, weights up for certain evaluations. And also looking at the scope, this is the aggregation, enforcing non-substitution of resources and therefore strong sustainability. Uh, this study here will be expected to be presented at a major uh, European conference this year, 2020. This is just to give a little bit of a visual of the Thrive platform, as I will get into using it shortly. 
It's available on the web as well as an app on Android. It's free, it's, it's a common good. Everyone can use it and indeed I encourage you to come and have a play with it and give us your feedback, which is what we're looking for right now, a constructive, critical feedback. So um, bring it on. <laughs> Um, before we get into the overview um, of the test, the test drive, I'd just like to highlight the sustainability performance scorecard, which most of the emphasis is on. Um, we can see here two diagrams. Basically, the green one represents enterprises at the enterprise, what we call the enterprise level. And then the yellow one there is at the industry level. Okay, what we can see in these diagrams is a rank performance uh, scorecard. So it shows performance over time. Um, there's a choice of formula engine that may have been used and that's displayed there and also classification system. It does support multiple entity levels and it uh, shows contextualized uh, values um, and the associated entity model to go with it. So who's hungry? Everyone still awake? <laughs> I have a cake for you all. This is called a chambella. You're probably gonna say, what has this got to do with sustainability? <laughs> well, for a strongly sustainable world, we have a cake. The resources we have, and we need to allocate proportionally to what we can use. Uh, so for a strongly sustainable world, every entity needs to be within that cake. So we develop a similar idea. It's called Chambella Charts. Um, it's uh, not a donut, though it does incorporate donut economics and other things into it. And essentially what we have is a, and I'll just get the laser here if this works. Does this work? You see the laser? Good. So we have a, an inner circle here, which uh, represents uh, an inner uh, floor. Um, and then we have an outer circle here that represents uh, social, I mean, uh, sorry, environmental ceiling. Um, closer to the middle is a sustainable organization, further out is not. So these points here represent individual performance on a particular topic, and a topic is a slice of this circle. The size of the slice, slice is an indication of the allocation. Okay, we'll go more into it with actual figures in a minute, but just to give you a bit broader an idea of what it is about, and the sustainability performance figure is the one that we see in the middle. This is another simpler chart maybe to look at with less uh, topics being examined. So it's like a scatter chart on top of a donut chart. It's a visual representation, and uh, while it looks very uh, unusual to you right now, um, once you start putting out thousands of these for various organizations, you can immediately very quickly recognize whether a company is sustainable or not, where it's lacking, where it could do better, et cetera. Um, you can compare these charts very quickly and easily once you get the hang of it. So as I said, it uh, shows the inner and outer thresholds. It um, displays the impact and the allocation performance. You can drill down on the chart into various levels of details like topic and subtopic themes, etc. And uh, this sort of infographic can actually be uh, also put on the client's sort of website or say if it's a corporation, that sort of type of thing. Now the formula engine, I won't go into the maths and stats that goes into the formula engine. It's uh, quite beyond the scope of today's session. However, I like to point out a few important aspects. Under strong sustainability, we must enforce uh, non-complementarity, and in other words, non-substitution. This is achieved using a formula function such as AMPI, which produces a non-linear composite index. Starting from a linear aggregation, it introduces a penalty for the units with unbalanced values of the indicators. It handles quantification of absolute changes by essentially quantitatively measuring well-being over time. So well-being of people, well-being of society, well-being of the world. These functions have been developed by two Italians which I have reached out to who have worked with the OECD on this and uh, that is Matteo Mazziotta and Adriano Pareto. We implement scale linking across each stratified level within context-based targets looking at impact, within available uh, resource allocation, that is numerator over denominator, i.e. impact over norms. We also take into account weight and allocations, normalization, and can handle first order and second order values. 
with strict and non-strict boundaries at each level. One thing to note is that you cannot do this with a spreadsheet. You need a relational database and high order statistical techniques. Therefore, the use of information system is essential in being able to model the complexities involved and chart the appropriate course of action ahead. This is an example or part example of one of the formulas, for example. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, the formulas go on at no length. There's quite a lot that's gone into working out the various formulas and there are many, and you can actually even define your own. A word on scale linking and context based, which is uh, a very important aspect in terms of ensuring uh, strong sustainability. Uh, we talk about navigating what we call the seven C's, that is from creature company, community, city, country, continent, and cosmos. That's from the lowest sort of nanoscale through to micro, meso, and up to the macro scale. Um, so each level usurps the, the one below it. It's a stratification of sorts, or, or you may think of it as granularity. Uh, this is necessary for context-based metrics. Uh, seven scales are uh, used in the Thrive model. And uh, of course, each one and adopts the sustainability uh, quotient at each level, measuring um, numerator over denominator, in other words. Now, I'd like to move to an example. Recently, the uh, World Benchmarking Alliance published what they call the Seafood Stewardship Index. You may or may not have heard of it. This is actually taken from their uh, website and they've actually ranked the uh, top 30 um, companies in the, in the seafood uh, industry. Now, the WBI was launched in 2018 and in October 2019, they produced, this is their first index. Uh, they claim it helps to identify what they call, <coughs> excuse me, uh, keystone actors. Now, our team reverse engineered the WBI SSI based methodology and uh, public data sets and we mapped it into the into the uh, Thrive system. Now unfortunately despite many attempts um, to ask the WBA uh, about uh, their specific source for their data sets uh, they were not forthcoming so we cannot be a hundred percent certain of the sources of the data that they use but they claim it was context-based. Um, so I'd like to break out at this point to, with an example, I'd like to switch to the actual Thrive software and um, we can then take it from there. Is there any immediate questions that come to mind right now that someone would like to ask before we start actually going for the test drive? So, so I, I don't Feedback. <clears throat> Sorry, my, my, my apologies. I, I keep unmuting the wrong uh, uh, the wrong uh, microphone. Um, so, so, Maurice, I'm not sure if it's something you want to bring up now or, or afterwards. Um, well, we're okay for uh, time. So far away. You, you've already brought up um, this is a general point, which is you want feedback on this, um, and yes. clearly, you know, part of the reason of you presenting to us is to get uh, more people engaged and involved in reviewing this and, and uh, uh, providing uh, feedback. Um, can you just, uh, I, so at some point before you finish, you should talk in, in more specifically about uh, what the people need to do to get involved uh, and, and that sort of yes, thing. Yes, I will be. And, and, okay, so I yes, just this wanted is, to make this, that. Is, this is not the wrap up. This is the, just the guided tour. Um, <clears throat> I just got to find out how to share this um, Screen as usual. I have a few monitors here in front of me, so it makes it a bit. Um, it, it's rubbly, we, see seafood, we see Seafood World Benchmarking Alliance. Oh, okay. Well, then it's working already. Okay, great. So this is uh, yeah. what this is what was produced. Do you see my map? This is what was produced by the World Benchmarking Alliance just recently. Uh, and as I said, it uh, looks at what they call keystone actors and they identify top 30 performers in the industry. So it's a scale of zero to five in their case, five being the highest, the most sustainable company and the top company there actually came out with a 2.7. Um, and then you can further go into and break down and see the breakdown of the figures. Could um, you scroll down a bit more so we could see what the criteria are up at the top? Sorry. 
There you go. Thank you. Ranking by different measurement areas. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, if you'd like to look at this, uh, if you want to type in their uh, uh, world benchmark in alliance.org and then go to rankings, you'll, you'll find the same thing. Um, but yeah, so this is what they've produced. And um, uh, I said, what our team did is reverse engineer this because as I said, they don't necessarily actually provide the source data set. They claim they're using public available data. So uh, that means it would be available from you know, GRI and other sustainability reports the like. Uh, and uh, we did look at those uh, as well. And from that, using then the methodology, we actually recreated this. So I'll show you this. Uh, so I'll go to the Thrive website. Uh, so this is Thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go through all the details of it. You can have a look at this yourself. This is at, uh, at um, strive to thriveearth um, so you can have a look at this anytime, but I shall log in and show you the WBA equivalent on the Thrive uh, platform. Okay, so this is a sustainability scorecard. Uh, the, the data in question that we're looking at is back on the first of December, that's when the report came out. And we're looking at using the uh, stewardship, the Seafood Stewardship Index, SSI, a bit of a mouthful, and using their methodology. There's a variety of methodology you can use, and I'll come back to this. You can add your own here. Uh, this is basically what we call the formula engine, how you actually are working things out, how you derive context, how you derive weightings, allocations, etc. Okay, so, here, what we're seeing is the equivalent on our system. Of course, the, the, the results are the same. However, we can drill down and see more. So here, for example, again, I mean, if I go back to here, you can see they got um, Thai Union Group is first and then Maui and et cetera. So coming back to our, on our uh, system, you know, you'll see the same thing. Here, we, got a, uh, we can see the business model, associated business model pattern, industry classification, and we can see their uh, sustainability score. For the material topics, I'll just show you here what the material topics choices can be. So, so, so Mor Mor Morris, those, bus those business model patterns on the previous slide, those are from uh, Ludica Freud and Joyce et al, right? Yeah, I was just getting to that. <laughs> okay. I was just about to show that. Yeah, these okay. business model patterns are from Ludica's Freud uh, study, uh, Florian study. Um, and uh, I was just going to show you. So for material topics, we have the different scales in here. So here we got the GRI. I'll just uh, open this up a bit. So you got the GRI scale, but uh, there's the SDG scale that's in there as well, for example, the ones that we're familiar with, the SDGs. Um, if you're familiar with the multi-capital scorecard, there's another set of topics there, but you can make your own. Uh, this is an individual sort of type of thing. Uh, and we've included the one for the seafood industry. Uh, they've actually got 60 topics they use, so I'll just open them up bigger. These are sort of the 60, 60 topics that it's used in their system. Okay, they're categorized into five broad bands, A, B, C, D, and E, what they call themes. For the business models, we are using for business model patterns. Again, because it's an agnostic platform, you can put it in your own or you can use some other system. Here, I'll give you the example using uh, Florian's study. Um, the naming he uses is this sort of notation, P1.1, 1.2, etc., And then P2.1, 2.2, etc., and so forth. So these are an example of business model patterns. They have fall, there's 45 patterns into 11 groupings if you use his system. Uh, there's some context around it, there's a source for it here, and there's also some examples available that he provides in his study. Um, if you look at um, uh, Ludeke Freud and Al 2018, you'll, you'll find this explained in more details. So going back to the SPS, by the way, if you're following along with this, best that you follow me on the screen here rather than going into the software, but you're obviously welcome to go in and have a play with it that later. Um, so, for example, let's 
uh, go back to... Sorry, Morris, just to be clear. So yeah. anybody can go to thriveplatform.info and, and see what you're looking at right yeah, now. Yeah, you'd have to register first. There's a registration, sign up registration page. It's free, though. You just register and then you can have a look. However, for the purpose of this demonstration, I suggest you follow along with me on the screen at, for now. Okay, and have a look at it later. So I, I'll be I'll be very I'll be very interested to know how many people you get signing up from the SSBMG. So I, I hope that you ask that demographic question during the sign up. Um, well, we we are able to know to to figure that out. Yes, yes. There's date timestamps so we can figure that part out, and we do ask um, other related questions. Anyhow. So I just want to give the breakdown here. So say we take this top company, which is equivalent to this uh, 2.7 out of five given by the WBA uh, folks. Um, we, we also calculated to 2.698, a little, little few more decimal places there, but it's the same number. If we click on this, we can actually then look at the breakdown of these figures. So this is now divided by topic. Okay, so there's 60 topics, as I mentioned earlier. So the overall score is this 2.7 that we talked about. However, this is a breakdown of the topics, okay? This scaling works from five to zero. Five is most sustainable, zero is least sustainable. And these are the uh, equivalent of the, of the working out using their system. There is, um, there's a couple of variables they use for allocation and weight, so there's a weight assigned to each of these topics, as well as an allocation, which is a size, if you think of it that way, like an impact. So again, I can open this up a little bit uh, more, so you can see a few more here. But you can see on a row by row basis, you can see actually the impact of each one of those headings. So area-based management, um, use of plastics, etc. cetera. There's, a, there's an actual figure showing the impact on that scale. Now, if we put this into in a diagram form, diagrammatic form, sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Um, we get what we call the Chambella charts, which I showed a little earlier. Now, very confusing when you've got 60 topics, so I'll make it a little bit easier. I'll bring it down to only a few topics. Okay, you can choose which topics you want to see. But in a diagram form, you can actually see much more visually um the points on the in the circle here or in the in the <clears throat> in the donut so the ones towards the bottom of the scale is your five and the ones towards the top are your are your zero okay so um you can visually see which topics they're performing better and not so good um and the size of the slice gives you an indication of how well they actually do it you can turn an individual topic on and off. So if you wanted to look at um, sustainability strategy, I can add that in like I've just done. And now I can redraw the diagram and it's added that one in. I can remove all of them and just choose the three or four that I want to look at as well. Um, so that's just uh, a little bit of an idea of what this is about. So we cannot go into everything in this session, but uh, certainly I welcome you to have a play at your leisure on this. I will go through some other examples now, but this is for the seafood uh, index. Uh, so you can see the rating here, you can see the associated business model for this particular company. This is its, its ticker code, BKKTU is its stock exchange code. Um, in this case, we've chosen 15 topics and uh, we're using this particular formula engine, which is the seafood stewardship um, method. Uh, we can also use a different formula engine, of course. So if I go back, back here, um, what I can do is, is say, well, what if we did the same thing, but we used the multi-capital scorecard method, okay, at the enterprise level. So now it's actually gone through and recalculated using the multi-capital scorecard. So now you'll find the figures have changed. For example, the figures are now between zero and 100% because that's how the multi-capital scorecard works. So the figures are in a different order here um, or in a different uh, range. Uh, but similarly, we can go in and then have a look at the breakdown of these figures. Okay. And we can go to the chart. So this is using the same set of seafood data by using the multi-capital scorecard approach in the calculation. 
so Morris, at, at first glance, the shape of the Chambella looks pretty similar to what we've looked at before. Yeah. Is, that, is that a bug or a feature? Uh, um, I wouldn't say neither. That's just the, the, due to the calculation, the method of calculation. Um, it, You'll find that, that I, I found it. Yeah. I, I guess, let me ask you another way. Is, is, are you typically going to find very similar reports from the different uh, formula engines or very different ones or all, varies all over the map? Well, that's, that's a $1 million question. You're asking exactly the most important question that needs to be asked. And what I found out is the following. Uh, we only got a limited amount of data that we got into the system. We only got about 8,000 records, about 100 companies or so at this point for this demonstration. As I said, it is a conceptual study. We are going to load millions of records because we've got them, but we haven't done so as of yet. So in terms of answering your question, what we found is generally, and I can show you this, demonstrate this, that let's say in the top five, you'll find that maybe four, three or four out of the top five appear in that top five using a different engine. Again, it depends on the engine, of course. So for example, I don't use FE01. That's an arithmetic mean. That is not a strongly sustainable approach at all. That invites substitution. That's just put there as a reference. It's actually, not, you would not use this because this is not the, the correct way of working things out. A geometric uh, approach or a weighted geometric approach is a reasonable baseline that you could start off with. Um, Multi-capital scorecard has its plus and minuses. Um, I've got an adjusted version of the multi-capital scorecard. Once again, we're, we're not today going to go in and explain all these formulas. Um, there's a normalized multi-capital scorecard, but there are many versions or variations that we see exactly the answer to your question you're looking at, whether the patterns are the same or not. So usually for top five, I'd say we find three to four of the top five come out the same. The one that we found to be the uh, what we feel is, I guess, the best, in quotes, I'll use that word, um, is uh, the MPI that I was mentioning earlier. Now, this is actually uh, somewhat, um, this is by the same authors in the OEC, in some of the OECD reports that we see out there. The, it's a Maciota Pareto uh, method. And this actually uh, takes into account weighting on unbalanced results. Uh, this really attacks the issue of substitution, ensuring that there is no substitution uh, between one resource and the other. In other words, taking a very strongly sustainable stance as much as practically possible, uh, notwithstanding errors in actual data and things like that. As I said, because the data we're using with the SSI is second order data, was you are from the WBA, um, we cannot be totally uh, assured that, that the results we're getting are uh, you know, strongly or less strongly sustainable, but we can be sure that we're gonna get results that either reinforces what they've done or shows how using a different formula engine, you can actually get a better result. Um, but that's using SSI data, the, the Seafood Stewardship Index. Uh, we've got other data in there, uh, and I can show you other examples. Does that somewhat answers your question? I said. It's sort of like a topic you can go on for an hour and, and we might have to take that up offline. Thanks for now, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> you also see a pattern with the, with the business models. Um, I think it was. If I have a look here, hang on, how do I get rid of this? While you're looking, Morris, uh, Rowan has a question. It says, would, yeah, okay. it, would it be fair to say that perhaps the finance industry might want to use a specific formula, whereas the government level, they might choose another formula? Correct. That's, that's the reason for the formula engine, because different people would want to use different approaches. But as I say, you can even create your own. You can have it put your own formula in. Um, we have actually have had a, um, talks with um, various people who said, uh, we love this, but uh, can we make our own formula? I said, yeah, you can make your own formula. Of course, you'll need to uh, you know, explain away your answers in reference to that formula engine that you choose to use. However, yes, you can create your own formula. I think this is one of the, the strengths of this system that you can only really do through uh, a database sort of implementation uh, for the, in terms of the complexity of it uh, and being able to implement the different uh, formula engines in here. Um, yeah, 
Morris. Yeah, this is Bill Bowie, and I just would yeah, underscore. Hi, uh, hey, Morris. Good to good to see you. Thank you. This is a really really great um, presentation, and I would just underscore what you're saying right now in terms of the strength of the formula engine, um, and just to put that into context, uh, to to you know not use a loaded term. Um, the you know one of the shortcomings of in my view uh, of the science based targets initiative is its kind of rigidity I guess you might say um, on the call it formula engine front in the sense that they have a um, a, a bias towards their own methodology of the sectoral decarbonization approach um, and so I I think that the one of the strengths among many of the tools uh, that you're presenting sorry I'm getting some feedback there but um, is is this um, agnostic or you know the ability to to choose different um, formulae and to, to you know to calculate accordingly and that gives the ability to, to sort of at test Gill's um, uh, question which is you know what what methodologies are strongest or most appropriate, um, and also for flexibility. So, you know, one of the other problems with the, the science-based targets initiative is that um, once the 1.5 degree uh, um, data scenarios came out from the IPCC, um, their preferred methodology, the sectoral decarbonization approach, was kind of locked in at two, two degrees. And it takes, you know, multiple years for uh, various um, organizations like the IEA to come up with sector-based uh, scenarios. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Can't hear you. Yeah, yeah carry on. Yeah, we, 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 we okay. can hear you okay. Okay, cool. I, I mean, I, I won't, I won't, I won't go further. I think I've made my point sufficiently well. But, but um, Morris, I think this is one of the one of the strong points is this kind of ability to to load different methodologies and approaches in and test them against one another. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is that that you know potentially what you're doing is is um, stronger than what the World Benchmarking Alliance. You, you might be able to do exactly what they're trying to do, but um, be more assuredly applying context to it. Um, uh, we, and we if like you to think so, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and if you if you if you're not getting answers from WBA, um, we might be. You know, R three is a uh, an alliance member, and so we might be able to sort of raise the 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 issue. Since you're a, an R three advocation partner or academic alliance partner, we might be able to um, work something out on that front. Yeah. Okay. No. Thanks. Thanks for that. We'll we'll uh, talk about that later. Um, yeah. As uh, Bill just pointed out, that is one of the strengths of the system. It's agnostic. It you can use any taxa. You can use any formula engine. Um, it takes care of the, the the behind the scenes stuff, the normalizing, the weighting, and that sort of thing. Based on what you say, you want it to do. So if you if you feel that, um, for example, let's say you were a, a policymaker, you you, you say, well, what if uh, what if we introduced a, a taxation on a particular thing or an import tax on something? So, what would be the impact of doing this? You could actually build that into your formula engine. Um, the current version of the historical data, as I said, is a conceptual study at this point, but it will be released later on this year. And then we'll be moving into the away from the historical data and using it as a predictive tool. So, we'll be looking at um, at uh, backcasting basing, based on the science, what the science shows us we need to do. So you could actually then do uh, uh, look at the future, basically, essentially. Well, so at the moment, everything in there is historical. Yeah? Morris, Sorry, um, this... Bob Will is asking, uh, Morris, have you had a chance to look at or consider the Future Fit business benchmark? Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, I have had a, a bit of a look and I've actually spoken with Bob about it um, and uh, I welcome, yes, I welcome further collaboration so we can actually integrate that in there. We also got on the agenda to put in the, uh, the 200 points from the um, BIA as well. Uh, we're looking at that. So uh, we can add these taxonomies in there. 
Um, so I will, yeah, I'm, I'm very much open to, to discuss with everyone to be able to add in uh, those particular uh, benchmarks or those particular uh, taxonomies, as we would call it, or, or, um, and also on the business model side, similar, um, whether it be a typology or a taxonomy, we can add those in and therefore uh, be able to, to generate that link. Because there is a way actually of um, sort of translating, transcribing, if I can put that in quotes, between one and the other. You can actually go from, from map like SDGs and GRIs, for example. You can actually do it. It is not 100%. I said there's still a lot to be done in this, this area, but it's certainly a very good starting point. And, uh, this system is very much what we call in, in, in our lingo, uh, like an information system, is data driven. It's only as good as all the data that goes into it. So, while we, uh, as we get more data, quality data into it, this system will be, you know, uh, predicting things uh, in a very good way. It's a bit like the, like the weather. I mean, how do, you, how do they tell us it's going to rain this weekend? It's because they have a huge data source. I mean, huge amounts of data they can rely on and, 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 um, uh, theoretical um, models of how things happen. And this what this is what this is. This is a modeling tool. It models what's going on there. So we welcome input from different systems and from uh, different data stores to make it work. It's not a repository in itself, but it makes sense of that repository. It makes sense of that data. So I had a few more things to go to, which um, um, you know, if there's anything specific you want to see here, I can show you now. Uh, quickly, otherwise I'll uh, go to a new set of slides and, and wrap up. Uh, I just want to show one thing about the, is there a question? There's, no? a, there's a few quick questions. I don't know if they apply here, but maybe we'll send them, we, we can yep. send them to the end or do you want to answer them now? Um, if it's in relation to the Thrive platform, yes. Uh, well, somebody is asking about whether B Corp and B, uh, B Impact Assessment is one of the uh, measurements that you're looking yes. at. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and if um, there's someone who's familiar with it, uh, we would like to work with them on it. If they working from a practitioner's point of view or academic, if they're more familiar with it, uh, then we are happy to work with them. But it is one of the ones we've got some data on and we're going to be adding it. Uh, okay, uh, Gil asked, who has vision as users of this tool and how do you expect them to use it? Also, who financed it and how do you get in touch with the CSR Hub? Yes, I'm familiar with CSR Hub. You, your question there was breaking up. What, what did you say again? Um, who do you envision the users of this tool and how do you expect them to use it? Who financed it? And then you mentioned about the CSR Hub. Yeah, okay. Um, at the moment, it's all self-finance. We're all volunteers, and I'll come to this in my concluding slides. We've got a, a bunch of volunteers throughout the world who are working on this. Um, insofar as the, uh, the CSR Hub, uh, we're familiar with uh, what uh, they do in there. I've also been in touch with them. Theirs is more of a repository, and it's not context-based. Uh, there's also another um, uh, group called Wikiray, which we've had ongoing uh, discussions with, which is somewhat, somewhat along the lines of what uh, CSR Hub are doing. Uh, they're based in Europe. I've had um, two or three meetings with them in Berlin over the last few years. And they uh, are using, uh, I mean, again, uh, they are a repository. So the focus is just on gathering data. And I say just, that's important but there is no uh, context, there's no strong sustainability, there's no scale linking, there's none of the things we need to actually uh, you know, take it from a strong sustainability point of view. There's no linkage to business model or strategy, none of that stuff is in there. It's more of a repository. And in the case of Wikipedia, at least the data is sourced mainly from university projects. So, you know, so that was a bit of a problem. Um, one final question before we go on, and we'll take the rest of the questions at the end. Um, what are the data sources for Terminator slash Statistical? Again? What are the data sources for denominator slash threshold data? That's from Bilbao. Oh, okay. Um, at the moment, um, most of the data sources for that is uh, United Nations, uh, WRI, CDP, um, and other sort of, uh, you know, uh, what we feel are, are good sort of uh, data sources and you know, GFN, et cetera. Um, so th that's what we're, we're using at the moment. Um, but of course, uh, 
in the future, we already got support with uh, things like the Internet of Things. We've got, uh, you know, sensors and drones. We've got direct metrics that will be coming into the system. Uh, once we scale up to, to an online cloud-based system, we'll, that's what we will be doing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly just show the industry level, uh, which is um, in a different color, just so, so you can recognize you at the industry uh, level. Uh, so here, for example, uh, there's a new set of formulas uh, that uh, you may use, for example, and it also calculates similar things. So this is at the industry level. So what we're going to see is enterprises within the industry and their performance. So if we, for example, go down here, just, uh, uh, which is not so fast as it used to be. <laughs> Um, so, um, so this is showing um, within a particular sort of uh, industry, and then you could click and see the background, the breakdown for that. Actually, I think uh, if I look for, uh, is it Russia? I think here, let's say, we look on, here and um, and say so here, here we see unsustainable companies, companies that are over the figure of one. So in this particular segment, this example, the overall score is 1.97. Uh, this is the list of companies uh, in well within the. Um, area of Japan, that was the country allocation. Um, and you can see the performance. So you can see here, for example, the weights in the allocation are just one. There's been no particular swaying towards one figure or the other, or X or weight added to one, but you could do that. You could actually use these weights um, as a means to, to foster a particular topic for whatever reason. Uh, you might want to um, increase the impact of a topic uh, like above its normal impact or you might want to decrease it for whatever reason and that may, may be. So uh, yeah, so I guess we'll go back to the to the slides. Maurice, just to let you know, I've, I've turned off everybody's video including you because your audio quality um, most of the time is really good but occasionally it, it falls away rather badly. So I'm hoping that yeah, I noticed stopping that your too. I'm guessing, yeah, no, I'm, hoping, I'm guessing it's because you have so many tabs open on your browser right now. Mm, no, I don't think it would be that, but it could be if people are swarming to the site um, for that side of it, <laughs> all going to having a look. Um, I'll, I'd will i like to just continue on with the rest of the end of the presentation. Keep going, Morris. Yeah. Um, so you can see my slides again? Yes. Okay. So this is the Thrive Platform Roadmap. Is everyone able to see that or? Yes. Okay, so just to give you an idea, this project as I started back in 2017, we've been added in 2018 and, and for last year, 2019. This version we've just uh, released at the end of last year or, or now, the, this year, um, is Thrive version 1.0 uh, or the Gamma version as we call it, that's quarter one uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, we have uh, already uh, part way through version two, which we're probably gonna launch uh, at the end of the, to coincide at the end of the study later this year, maybe middle to, to um, third or second to third, end of second or third quarter of this year, uh, probably to coincide with some. What the differences in V2 might be? Yes, yes, I, I'm coming to that in my next slide. And then version three will be next year in 2021. Yes, um, this is on my next slide. So, um, so far as the roadmap, so version one, um, just hold on a tick, I've got to get some information up here. Uh, so version one, 
everything is really slowed down. Um, so yeah, so the, the project itself is a Creative Commons, not-for-profit platform. So anyone can use it. That's the current version, version one. Um, so we look at uh, data that's been captured by systems and as well as the Internet of Things, robotics, drones, cameras, sensors, and so forth. And we find that the information, the methods, and the patterns, um, since they're fairly obscured because they're such vast sort of data sets, we need to do this sense making. Hence why we uh, use this sort of platform to encourage enterprises to be a force for good. So Thrive version one is our minimum viable product. It's built for function, not for form. So it's not necessarily pretty, but it does the job. It measures entity performance based on public data. It categorizes on entity or business model using machine learning. Um, and that, in actual fact, uh, I was speaking to Rob Eccles. He's a proponent of uh, using machine learning for this sort of thing. Um, it involves, it handles scale linking using context and science-based data sets. So based on a formula engine and predominantly at this point, version one uses historical data and static snapshots. It oh, it's very slow. I'm trying to get the next. Okay, version two of Thrive will support global thresholds and allocations. And I must say, we're already part way through version two and um, it's not complete yet, but uh, we're well on our way with it, though we haven't released until we do the formal launch. So it supports thresholds and allocations. It has predictive analytics for backcasting. In other words, implements the FSSD and global threshold and allocations. It has an interactive dashboard with levers and animated time sliders. So you can actually, instead of looking at a, snap, at, at a snapshot, you could actually move the time slider over time and it has a more interactive uh, dashboard. So it embraces real-time um, data acquisition, in other words. Now, as we scale up, we will be, uh, you know, for big data support, we'll have version three uh, that uh, will be at the beginning of next year. That'll be a multi-user, scalable, cloud-based distributed system. It'll implement smart, smart, uh, smart social contracts. That's for the governance model. So that's entity to entity contracts, like in a circular economy situation. Um, this is sort of blockchain or distributed ledger technology you, you might know it as. We'll, there'll also be some form of gamification of the service because we'll also be opening up the, the nano-level implementation. That's the individual, um, implementation where a person um, can in their own right be as sustainable as they can be. Um, now for those more technically minded that might want to know a little bit about how has this been put together, Thrive is a web-based application. It's developed in PHP, HTML and JavaScript uh, using an agile methodology. Uh, the database is powered by ProgressQL and our machine learning is done in Python and we have import routines in Python and Perl. And it also implements enforces for the social contracts using Ethereum 2.0. Um, going on to the next slide, uh, just looking at time. Final thoughts. Um, so we live in a society that is data rich and information come knowledge or wisdom poor. We must make efforts to contribute to solutions to a resilient, restorative and regenerative smart economy. Uh, as others have said, um, even present here in this session, I believe, there is no sustainable business in an unsustainable world. So how do we encourage enterprises, industries and so forth to be a force for good? We need to foster, we need to foster uh, competition, yet at the same time encourage collaboration for the common good. As we know, true co collaboration among a wide range of partners is complex, requiring a willingness to declare goals before you have a plan and to invite co-creation. So think of circular economy uh, and sharing economy models. And lastly, sorry, everything's going slow here. Thrive is not just another measuring tool. 
It is a holistic system simulation model and framework built on first principles, employing science-based targets based on what the science tells us is necessary and sufficient to ensure a thrivable society and a prosperous future for all. So thank you. Um, if you have any questions or like to participate in the evaluation or like to access the slides, please visit strive to thriveearth I'd like to point out that these days Thrive is a worldwide team. We have over 17,000 followers. You can follow me on LinkedIn as I blog regularly on this platform with important related topics. I encourage you to contribute and participate in the review process. Please sign up. You can do so freely at the, at the website and you will get early access to behind the scenes information and study results, uh, including empirical underlying data indicating which business models have been shown to be more, most sustainable. Uh, interested to know more details about the Thrive Framework? Have a read on my forthcoming paper available from next month. We still on? We are. It's interesting. Okay. We, we're, we're, we're worried about a little glitches in our technology, but in my short lifetime, we used to write on rice paper and put in paravion envelopes and wait three months for response. To come <laughs> <in>. <laughs> and hopefully we didn't lose too many, but the slides will be available online, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. So there are, there are th thank you very much, Morris. Um, uh, there, there's a bunch of uh, qu more questions in the chat. Um, yep. And probably people have got some others. We've just got a few minutes left, and we do like to respect our end time. Um, so well, I'm going to suggest two things. On. Well, if if yeah, you like, we'll, we'll, we'll take them on, and I can reply to them in in by email. Uh, it, it, exactly. Well, I was I was going to suggest that we move this conversation to the LinkedIn group. Um, so underneath the advert for this month's meeting, and maybe Laurie, <laughs> you'd like to put a the URL for. This yep, it's in the, 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 there, there's a bunch. If you just scroll up in the chat, you'll find a number of links, including the Thrive site and the LinkedIn, um, uh, the Benchmarking Alliance, the Thrive.Earth, and the LinkedIn group are all up, uh, up in your chat. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Laurie. So, so maybe we, we uh, respond to these um, uh, outstanding questions uh, in the LinkedIn chat and try and get a bit of a conversation uh, going there and obviously we can act mention that you'll ask the question so I, maybe Morris you could work with Laurie to uh, make that happen yeah. if, if you need some help sure so there are a few questions though we've still got a little bit of time so um, Laurie you've been doing right. a great job facilitating the questions do you want to continue to do that I can do yeah. that uh, so let me just scroll down because I scrolled up a second ago. Um, we, did you already talk about your business model? Somebody had asked about what the business model, assuming it's not a not for profit. You mentioned the Creative Commons. Is that your, is there a business model at, in part of what you're doing here? Um, well, we see Thrive, the Thrive platform is a common good. The Thrive framework, which is the theory that goes into it behind the scenes, is still a work in progress um, that, as I said, will be released later this year. Uh, that's part of uh, actually my uh, research uh, topic. But the platform itself, the aim of it is, is uh, I mean, the, the purpose of it is to be freely available to everyone. So that, that will not change. Yeah. Um, you know, this, the idea is that as an individual, you can go in there and literally vote with your wallet for where you wanna buy your products next time. I mean, next time you buy your shampoo, you could go in there and look, well, who do I buy my shampoo from and how sustainable are they as a company? Should I be buying from someone else? And you can actually see on the list, maybe another company that's more sustainable. And you say, well, look, I want to vote with my wallet and say, I'm going to start buying from a more sustainable company and therefore encourage, encourage companies to become more sustainable. Right. Nice. Um, my question is, uh, I'm curious how IoT sensors can feed into the data collection. Is that uh, uh, functionality already part of the, the platform? That's that's part of uh, it's the support for it is part of version two, which is uh, in in development now. Uh, the implementation of it, like in being released to the for public use, it will come out with uh, version three, which includes the nanoscale. So, Internet of Things, nanoscale, individual uh, sustainability is all part of um, the one sort of package, if you can think of it that way. Okay. So, individuals can I, monitor I, their own sorry. sustainability. 
Mm -hmm. Are you looking or interested in connecting with people that are trying to use sensors to measure uh, sustainability, for example, in buildings? We're, we're working on a project in buildings. Well, so. well, we're already working with people with, uh, with sensors for things like uh, ocean uh, acidity um, and, and those sort of type of sort of like mostly environmental sensors, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's drone technology and all sorts of things being applied mm -hmm. where they're actually monitoring our water levels, all sorts of things. So we've, we've got some people working with us for that side of things, but we welcome more. The more, the better. As I said, the, the, the amount of data that the system can handle is really not a big issue because it's not meant to be a repository. It's not storing data. It's making sense of the data. So we're dealing with a lot of numbers, um, but we are uh, br bringing in information from other systems, crunching those numbers to make sense of them. And oh. that's what the Thrive Framework does. So yeah, we're Perfect. definitely interested Thanks. in any of those people. Uh, and more so, so about uh, if you're able to shift from Ethereum to Holochain. Um, I, I must say, I don't know that much about Holochain. Um, so <laughs> if anyone has expertise in this area, uh, talk to us and work with us on this. Um, if you if you can provide a little bit of your time, I'd be very happy to discuss. Um, um, Morris, um, um, uh, there are still, there are still a number of questions to, to respond to, and I've just posted a, a process in the chat uh, to how we could deal with okay. that. Um, but I was wondering if you could just close um, by succinctly stating if there are people here, and I know there's at least one person in the room here who want to follow up with you. Um, and, and get involved in the pro in in the project, which obviously is the idea of this group to uh, yep, correct. promote uh, collaboration and cooperation. Can you just succinctly say what it is that you're looking for and how yep. they get involved? Okay. Uh, well, I think the first thing I'll preface is this is a common good. So we're doing this uh, for the love of it more than for any other sort of material sort of. Um, um, you know, financial gain or, or what have you not. So we're looking for people who have a, a passion for sustainability, who may have expertise in whatever particular area. They may be a practitioner, academic. They may just be Joe Blog sort of thing. Or maybe just be an ordinary person who says, look, I believe in this and I want to help. So we actually will encourage people regardless of where they are located physically or what the area of interest to come in. Of course, sustainability means uh, many things to different people. So everyone has their own thing. Some people want to recycle plastic. Some people are worried about the, the, the fish in the ocean, you know, et cetera. People have different, you know, energy. They have different uh, interests. So we encourage all these people to contact us. Uh, we have a number of working groups that we've established, but we're always looking to, to, to head up more and, and even conjoin people into those groups where there might be only two or three people and that can become five or six people working on a particular area. The website to go to is strive to thrive .earth. Um, There is a, a web link there. Um, I mean, uh, an email link there. But if you send to Morris at strive to thrive .earth, uh, that works. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, my name is at the bottom of all of those slides that you saw. And uh, yes, we're just really encouraging people to, to assist with this um, uh, project because it is important and it will make a difference. Uh, it is already starting to make a difference for some of the people who are collaborating with us. So we feel it has enormous potential uh, and um, we, we, we just got to get the message out there and get more and more people involved with it. So yeah, please do do sign up. If nothing else, just sign up and have a play with it just to get an understanding what it's about and see how it applies to you because it does apply to people at various levels. You can sign up on the strive to thrive .earth website. There's a sign up page uh, there. And then you can log in for free and use it after that. So yes, thank you. And you know, thanks Anthony for your support on this project over the years as well. Absolutely, Morris. And thank you for the presentation today. We're a minute or so over time and uh, do want to respect uh, that. Um, so thank you, Morris, for your presentation. And I know you had a number of colleagues with you uh, today. So thank you for joining. Uh, as mentioned in the chat, uh, Morris will reply to any outstanding questions in the LinkedIn post about this month's meeting. And I'm encouraging Morris to make a separate post about specifically about how he would like to engage with all of us as members of the SSBNG to, uh, to bring this work forward. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say out loud what I've also commented to you privately, uh, Morris, um, since the last time you and I had a deeper conversation about this, which is, uh, what, nine months ago or so, uh, you really have come a very, very long way. So I, I was personally just wanted to say that I was very impressed by 
uh, what you've demonstrated today, and I, and I think a number of other people on the call were, were as well, and, and you've got, you, you provoked quite a lot of curiosity uh, as well, so that's all good. Uh, so thank you again, Morris. Um, just to uh, wrap, um, next, you're very welcome. Um, that's what this group is all about. Um, so uh, next month, uh, we have a presentation on uh, capability to handle complexity, uh, which is an HR uh, orientated approach to thinking about how do we ensure uh, people uh, in the jobs who need to be engaging with the complexity around sustainability are actually able to engage effectively with that complexity. So a really important um, practical issue, uh, you know, is how do we get people uh, able to deal with the inconvenient truth that what we're asking of them is significantly more complex than the profit first way of doing business. So I hope you all join us for that. It's the second, as always, put this in your calendars now. It's the second Tuesday of every month that we meet uh, at 4.30, 16.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, so UTC minus five. Um, so the next meeting will be on February, Tuesday, February the 11th. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, slides and uh, recording will be available. Uh, again, we'll post the link to uh, the comments on the LinkedIn post about this meeting. So thank you all very much. Uh, great turnout today. Great questions. Thank you for your engagement. See you next month. Or see you online before then.